the pleasure of introducing our first speaker of the day, uh, Wellesley's very own Professor Lawrence Rosenwald. Welcome. Professor Rosenwald joined the Wellesley community as the Ann Pierce Rogers Professor of American Literature in 1980. Since receiving his BA, MA, and PhD from Columbia University, he has published many books and essays from Multilingual America to an edition of Ralph Waldo Emerson's journals. As a pacifist and member of New England's war tax resistance since 1987, his current studies focus on nonviolence and literature. In addition to being a writer, he is a practicing translator a performer of theater verse, and has co-directed Wellesley's Peace and Justice Studies program since 2001. Known for his engaging theatrical lectures and open-ended seminars, please join me in welcoming Professor Rosenwald. Here's the thing. I've, I've given two previous talks on this topic at this institute in 2012 and 2013. And I began both of them by noting that the list of institute speakers included no poets, no fiction writers, no dramatists. Then I asked whether that was a bad thing, whether writers of imaginative literature belonged here as persons of authority. I considered the question and concluded that they did. It's not very surprising. <laughs> Um, I'm still occupied with that question. It's become, in fact, an increasingly important question for me. For that, among many other things, my thanks to Joe Joyce and Joanne Murray, their support of this aspect of my work has helped me to see more clearly what mattered to me, and that's not a small gift. I'm still arguing that the makers of imaginative literature have some authority here. And I'll get to that argument in a moment. But I can't begin in the same way. I don't have the same target to shoot at. <coughs> Excuse me. Because as, <coughs> ah, clap. because as you probably observed, this year's list of speakers does indeed include a poet, a very distinguished poet, in fact, my friend and English department colleague, Dan Chasen, who's sitting up there in the corner, <coughs> whose presence here has something to do with the arguments I've made on this matter in the past. I'm delighted he's here, and I know you'll find his comments not only illuminating, but useful. But winning an argument, if that's what I've done, presents some challenges. I mean, if you lose and you think you're right, you just keep on making your case. But what do you do if you win? Dan's here this year. Probably future iterations of the Institute will also feature imaginative artists. And the question of whether such artists belong at the Institute's table has been settled by the Institute's directors. So maybe I should just declare victory and go home. <laughs> Which, of course, I'm not going to do. I am, after all, here. And shortly I'm going to address my topic, but maybe in a different way, with a different emphasis shifting from whether imaginative artists have authority here, to how, to what the nature and use of that authority might be for you who are trying to deal with the geopolitical world we live in. To the topic then, but first a clarification of the term authority in this context. Certain literary works have had great political power, political influence. Uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, for instance, or Upton Sinclair's 1903 novel, The Jungle. <clears throat> when Abraham Lincoln met Stowe, he said, so this is the little lady who made the big war. Sinclair's book helped pass the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. 
I've read and reread and taught both books, and I admire them, but they're both propaganda pieces. Good propaganda pieces in the service of good causes, but propaganda pieces nonetheless. And the function of propaganda isn't to exercise authority in deliberation, to help us think something through. It's to persuade its consumers of a prefabricated truth by means of a skilled appeal to the emotions. So it's not so relevant here. As regards authority in the sense that matters here, the authority in deliberation about the world that I'm thinking about this morning. Well, some writers claim that imaginative literature has such authority in abundance. Um, Shelley's remark is the most famous, probably. Poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Wallace Stevens writes that poetry is a violence from within that protects us from a violence without, a phrase I owe my acquaintance with to Dan Trayson, by the way. Uh, William Carlos Williams makes his claim in verse, I quote, It is difficult to get the news from poems, yet men die miserably every day for lack of what is found there. Other writers oppose such claims, though, and not unreasonably. W. H. Auden states the counterclaim most clearly, quote, poetry makes nothing happen, close quote. That implies that if we're in a situation in which making something happen is what most matters to us, to feed the hungry, defend the powerless, shelter the endangered, then poetry is of no use to us, not contingently, but in its nature. Which makes some sense, clearly. Poetry may be in some contexts a violence from within that protects us from a violence without, but it's hard to imagine it as a defense against a machete during the Rwandan genocide, or to shift the perspective somewhat as a shield against an American drone attack. So the writers themselves are of many minds. Uh, how do we proceed? Whom do we follow? My own claim, in my view at any rate, takes account of both the claims just stated and is as follows. That imaginative literature has authority in two ways. One of them bearing on the world as it is, one of them bearing on the world as it might be, and that both of them are collaborative rather than coercive. I'll explain the former mode of authority, the one bearing on the world as it is, by making some comments on a common way of talking. You may even have said something like this yourself or heard somebody say it. People say things like these. Tolstoy teaches us what war is like. Stendhal teaches us how success is gained. Theodore Dreiser teaches us what it means to be poor. Toni Morrison teaches us what it means to be black in America, or most perplexingly, Vladimir Nabokov teaches us what it's like to live in theocratic Iran. I'll come back to that last sentence later, noting for the moment only that it's paraphrased from the work of Iranian memoirist and literary critic um, Azar Nafizi in her work called Reading Lolita in Tehran. The way such sentences are usually read misidentifies, in my view, the source of authority. The only persons who can credibly formulate such sentences are people who can, on the basis of their own experience, compare the fictional depiction with the real thing. Suppose it's me who says, Tolstoy teaches us what war is like. Fine, I'm entitled to my opinion, but no one should pay attention to it I have no direct experience of war, so how on earth can I know whether Tolstoy is telling the truth about it? If a soldier says it, though, we should all pay attention, and we do. And similarly, for being rich, being poor, being black, being Iranian. <laughs> 
But that doesn't mean that Tolstoy and company have no authority here. Rather, it means that their authority is collaborative, dialogic, relational, probably a bunch of other synonyms. Consider again the claim that Nafizi makes. She writes that Nabokov's Lolita is, and now I'm quoting, the work of fiction that would most resonate with the lives of women in the Islamic Republic of Iran. That seems preposterous, no? Nabokov knew nothing about Iran. He died before the Islamic Republic was created, and his book tells the story of a cultivated European pedophile's rape and kidnapping of a 12-year-old American girl. What Nafizi's memoir shows us, though, is that Nabokov's book teaches her things about life in Iran that she herself, she, the Iranian, did not know not because Nabokov knew them, but because his book enabled her to know them. The authority the literary text has here is an authority liberated in it by those who can judge it, who have their own authority on whatever matter is in question, but who recognize that they can learn something from that text that they cannot learn without it the soldier learning about war from Tolstoy, Nafizi learning about Tehran from Nabokov, the prisoners at San Quentin learning about prison life from a 1957 performance of Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot. That's a famous story, by the way, and, and not restricted to San Quentin. There were other performances in other prisons, and the experience of Revelation was the same. Beckett had never been in prison. In somewhat the same way, what a therapist says to a client can enable a client to know things about his or her own life that previously he or she was unable to know, not because the therapist knows them, but because the therapist enables the client to know them. It takes two as Stephen Sondheim says. Well, actually, it's the baker and the baker's wife in Into the Woods who say that, but, you know, <laughs> they're Sondheim's puppets. Um, mouthpieces, whatever. Um, the second mode of authority, bearing on the world as it might be, requires a longer explanation, and I'll spend much of my remaining time setting it out. So settle in. This is a longer and trickier uh, argument. It involves considering the difference between ends and means. We sometimes think of particular policy objectives as ends in themselves. Literacy, free elections, the infrastructure projects that this year's institute is focused on and which you'll soon be investigating from satellites to libraries to hospitals to roads. In fact, though, those projects are not ends in themselves. They're means to other ends, more elusive ones. We have names for those other ends, but no algorithms for reaching them. Happiness, justice, peace, holiness, dignity, human flourishing, and for that matter, the flourishing of the world we live in and are a part of, but not the whole, the health of the ecosystem, the organic radiance of the planet. These are states we do not fully understand, cannot define, and are not in possession of. They are utopian, conjectural, hypothetical. To move towards them, we have to imagine them. And if we have to imagine them, then we must turn for expertise to those whose discipline is precisely a cultivation of the imagination. I kept looking in, in Justin Lin's chapters, the, one you all, the ones you all read as um, you know, preparation for the Institute, for some moment when infrastructure is understood not as an end but as a means and came across one which I quote, 
In Morocco, girls' school attendance rose from 28% to 68% between 1985 and 1995 with the construction of all-weather roads. That's the end of the quote. That makes building the roads a means and girls' school attendance an end. I'm certainly in support of increased girls' school attendance in Morocco or anywhere else, but such attendance is also itself a means. The goal can't be just attendance. It has to be the flourishing of the girls attending, their increased joy and dignity and sense of holiness the flourishing of the community they live in and of the ecosystem in which the community is situated, which flourishing is, as noted, something concerning which the artistic imagination has authority. Imagination meaning what, since I've been throwing around that word pretty freely without defining it. One important aspect of the idea is summed up in a remark made by the 19th century playwright Friedrich Hebel, who said that in a good play, everyone is right. The person who believes in increased girls' school attendance and the one who opposes it as blasphemy. The girls who attend school and the families who sometimes try to keep them from attending. And to invoke the most controversial example of imaginative even-handedness that I can think of, the Pakistani activist for women's education, Mala Yousafzai, the youngest person ever nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and the people who tried to kill her for her work. I have, myself, no sympathy for her would-be murderers. But it's not clear to me that someone interested in providing, say, educational infrastructure in Pakistan wouldn't benefit from trying to imagine them. If the imagination is to transcend and transform experience, I'm quoting the late poet and activist Adrian Rich, and I'd put the chief emphasis here on the word transform. You have to be free to play around with the notion that day might be night, love might be hate. Nothing can be too sacred for the imagination to turn into its opposite or to call experimentally by another name. <clears throat> so that's pretty abstract. Um, here's a concrete example in relation to the infrastructure category water, which some of you will be working on. I've twice been in Varanasi, the sacred Indian city by the Ganges River. The river is filthy. I've read reports of how much untreated sewage is pumped into it, how many bacteria are found in its water, how many Indian sicknesses are caused by the waterborne infections it carries. But I've also watched people bathe and wash and shave and defecate in the river on ordinary days. I've watched throngs of people immerse themselves in it on holidays. I've watched corpses being burned at its edge and their ashes or uncremated body parts dumped into it afterwards. I've seen dead cows floating in it. A good many of the bathers and washers and shavers impressed me as being extraordinarily happy. And what I've read and heard about the city supports that impression. It's not surprising. For many of the bathers, contact with the river is an encounter with the divine, and contact with the divine is among the elements of human happiness. Would the bathers be happier if the Ganges were cleaned up, if they were forbidden to wash or shave or defecate there, if the ashes of corpses were no longer deposited in it? If you, bring it to you, uh, we're deciding on infrastructure projects in India. Would you invest in 
sewage treatment plants, in reliable electric generators to power the plants, in mechanisms to provide water to fields that are now being watered with water diverted from the sacred river. I never immersed myself in the river. The prospect frightened me. I'm a timid, phobic person. And I don't have an answer to the question I've posed. But if it's a legitimate question, then artists have legitimate authority here. If in a good play, everyone is right, then in this play about Mother Ganga, everyone is right too. The person who pollutes the Ganges and is happy and feels holy, no less than, though also no more than, the person who feels unclean even thinking about the river as it is and wholeheartedly believes that Indians would be happier and more flourishing if only the Ganges could be cleaned up. So that's one example, and here's a second. This is more like a text than an example. Uh, it's famous in the history of African-American writing and has brought resonance, in my view, even outside that history. In his 1900 autobiography, Up From Slavery, the educator and reformer Booker T. Washington, founder of Tuskegee Institute, told what seemed to him a story with an obvious moral. I quote, one of the saddest things I saw during the month of travel which I have described was a young man who had attended some high school, sitting down in a one-room cabin with grease on his clothing, filth all around him, and weeds in the yard and garden engaged in studying French grammar. Three years later, in The Souls of Black Folk, the intellectual and activist W.E.B. Du Bois commented on that passage as follows. So thoroughly did Washington learn the speech and thought of triumphant commercialism and the ideal of material prosperity that the picture of a lone black boy poring over a French grammar amid the weeds and dirt of a neglected home soon seemed to him the acme of absurdities. One wonders what Socrates and St. Francis of Assisi would say to this. So, Washington sees in the young man a self-destructive idler, self-indulgently attending to what is of no use to him in combating his own filthy poverty. Du Bois, and also, at least in Du Bois's view, Socrates and St. Francis of Assisi, one of the West's great intellectuals and one of the West's great saints, both of them political activists as well. Du Bois and Socrates and St. Francis see in the young man an idealist, making a choice that harms no one but himself, if indeed it harms even himself, and which by all evidence makes him happy. <coughs> The inquiring mind transcends its material circumstances and seeks to grow. In that attempt, it finds its bliss. What social policies would follow from thinking of the lone black boy not as an idler, but as a visionary? Or, more concretely, if you're in the business of providing educational infrastructure, do you provide it for the great administrator Washington or the young man dreaming of speaking French? Most of the time, of course, it's people like Washington who get the planner's ear. But would he get yours? I'll move towards my conclusion by asking you a practical question. I've been asking you questions along the way, but this is lengthier. Um, and more specifically focus on an assignment of yours. Um, and then I'm going to tentatively answer my own question. You are required to consult with two experts as you prepare your final reports. Could you, to meet that requirement, legitimately consult with a maker of imaginative literature? Why or why not? Well, to start with, here's why not, um, to be fair and to tell the truth. 
because imaginative writers are unlikely to be able to quantify their comments and because in infrastructure projects the numbers need to come out right. Because their focus, the focus of imaginative writers, tends to be on what strikes them as the significant detail but others might dismiss as unrepresentative anecdote. Because the route leading from the significant detail to a policy recommendation would be a winding one with an uncertain time of arrival. <clears throat> and because though in a good play everyone is right, in making policy you have to identify some people and some projects as more right than others. But here's why. Because the works of imaginative writers suggest what makes the lives of individuals happy or unhappy, empty of purpose or replete with it, sacred or profane. Because imaginative artists don't, whatever else they do, depend on abstractions. And if we depend on abstractions, we're more likely to mistake the map for the territory and mispredict the consequences of our intervening actions. Because the projects you'll be thinking about are as yet unrealized. So who knows but that the artist might be able to get outside the box and imagine an unforeseen end or means. The why and the why not seem equally strong to me. So here's my answer to my question. You'll obviously have to answer this question for yourselves, but for what it's worth. Yes, imaginative artists should count as experts. But though you'll be better off having one such expert than none, you'll also be better off having one rather than two allowing the artists the authority artistry can have, but not pretending it's sufficient authority or autonomous authority or the only authority in town. Any more than that other authority we're more used to is sufficient or autonomous or the only game in town. To quote Sondheim again, it takes two. Now my real conclusion. Um, <clears throat> as some of you know, and uh, as was alluded to, I teach courses here not only in English but also in Peace and Justice Studies. And some of you in this room have taken some of those courses from me. In teaching Peace and Justice Studies courses, <coughs> I work hard to attend to the findings of history and the social sciences. But I'm aware as I do this of how often in the history of peace and justice work the imaginative improvisations of ordinary people have transcended the predictions and expectations of professionals, historians and social scientists among them, who before the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955 would have predicted the American Civil Rights Movement, who before 1989 would have predicted the relatively peaceful fall of the Berlin Wall, and for that matter, all of what lay behind the then formidable Iron Curtain, who before the self-immolation of Mohammed Bouazizi in Tunisia would have predicted the Arab uprisings? The answer is pretty much no one, by the way. Um, it's a rhetorical <laughs> question. Uh, when I talk with my students about these movements, I suggest to them how hard it is to understand, to imagine certain forms of human power and human heroism. What I've been talking about with you this morning is how hard it is to understand, to imagine certain aspects of human flourishing. In both situations, I'm arguing that one limitation of our scientific enterprise is a limitation of imagination. In this situation in particular, here and now, I'm arguing that we'd do better in this heroic and necessary enterprise we're all part of if we gave a more prominent place in it to the imagination and to those whose discipline it is to cultivate it. Thanks very much. Over to you. Um, when you were giving your example from Booker T. Washington's writings about the man who wanted to learn French, yeah. um, 
it reminded me of something that I read in one of my classes. Um, it was a biography, uh, an autobiography from Luis Buñuel, and he had said himself that when he was growing up, um, even though um, his background, he, he didn't live in poverty, but he wasn't that wealthy either, and yeah. he said that the people around him were spiritually rich, but not commercially rich, yeah. and he implied that they often were mutually exclusive. You couldn't be spiritually rich and traditionally not wealthy, but have enough to survive. And I was wondering, it seemed in your lecture that your examples supported that, where it seemed like being happy and fulfilled and having what you need to survive were not in conjunction with one another. And I was wondering if you had any examples where they are. Oh, um, that's a really good question. Uh, so I chose examples uh, deliberately in which the mode of happiness uh, at issue was one that from a skeptical or commercial or um, I'm not sure what the right adjective is, viewpoint would look preposterous, right? Because I wanted to suggest as strongly as possible the unpredictable character of human happiness or human holiness. I don't at all think uh, that those, well, Let's see. There's some um, important literature in the West, at any rate, that's come into controversial prominence lately that suggests some difficulty in reconciling uh, spiritual exaltation and commercial success, most prominently in relation to claims made by Pope Francis. Uh, who quotes, among other texts, that the, the New uh, Testament text about it is hard as a rich man. It is, hard, it is as hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven as it is for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Now, that's not a, that's not a wild-eyed, well, it, maybe it is a wild-eyed radical ideal, but it has a long history in the West and considerable um, prestige attached to its traditions. I don't, however, think that those things are, in fact, incompatible. And the case of the Ganges bathers, by the way, is actually not uh, a matter of economic uh, <coughs> destitution and spiritual exaltation. The people who immerse themselves in the Ganges are not necessarily poor, and some of them I know from conversations with them are not. Right. So there, what's at issue is two different sets of values rather than the specific opposition between um, <coughs> poverty and spiritual intensity. Um, I mean, I could, prob I could come up with some other examples, um, but, I, but in any case, I don't mean to suggest um, yeah. that there's a necessary opposition at all. I think the opposition has some, some teeth to it and some, some powerful history. It's a very challenging idea to, to deal with, but thank you for your question. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> When you were talking about consulting with poets and literary authors yeah. um, when making big policy decisions, yeah. uh, I was wondering how would you recommend or how do you envision choosing which poets and which literary authors you consult with? Um, would you consult with the ones that are well-known and well-respected or would you seek out new minds that haven't been discovered? How would um, how do you see that you one? Know, you know, if, we, if I get to the point where somebody is actually trying to work this out, you know, where the, <clears throat> I, I, I would already consider that a, a, great, a great victory. And, um, I mean, my own sense about poets and dramatists and writers of fiction is that the very best there are are the ones I would want to consult with most. That is, I, I quoted great poets um, because it seems to me that if you're a really great poet, then you are a capacious and comprehensive poet, and all things matter to you. You don't exclude them from your consideration. If you're a really great novelist, like Tolstoy, then, you, then everything matters, and you try to learn about everything. If you're a really great dramatist, similarly, like Shakespeare or like Grace. So I think my first criterion would be you know, majesty or excellence. And then beyond that, I'd look for people who wanted to talk to me. I mean, you know, there are, there are people inside the imaginative disciplines 
who want to stay inside the imaginative disciplines. Right? There's a famous essay uh, by, to move outside of literature for a minute, by the American avant-garde composer who died recently, um, Milton Babbitt. Uh, the essay is called, Who Cares If You Listen? It wasn't his title, but it's not a bad title. And it's about the fact that what he's trying to do is cultivate certain formal relations among pitch and rhythm classes. Right? He's not that interested in whether you like it or not. Right? So maybe I wouldn't consult him first. Um, although he was one of Stephen Sondheim's teachers. But, um, but I was, so the first criterion would be excellence, and the second would be dialogic availability. I, I don't know. I mean, uh, do you have any thoughts about that? If you were picking, somebody said to you, pick, pick five poets to consult on the next uh, infrastructure initiative. I, I was very persuaded by what you said. Okay. Right. Okay. Other question or comment? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you mentioned, excuse me, briefly about the difference between propaganda and yeah. literature, literary works. Yeah. But um, especially when looking at literature written during, say, a revolution, yeah. I find it really hard to distinguish between the two. And so this is kind of a two-part question. The first is, is there any value um, looking at the projects we're going to be doing yeah. and looking at works that might be considered propaganda? And if so, or if not, how do we better distinguish between you know, art and literature and propaganda? Yeah, it's a, so as I said, I, I, propaganda is a, a sort of tricky word in this context. Um, it has only a negative connotation when we use it mostly, but we need some term that's not implicitly negative. I mean, the propaganda initiates, again, to go back to the, uh, the Catholic tradition I alluded to before, it's, 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 it's the list of works de propaganda fide, the ones for spreading the faith. All right, so it's a term about, that has to do with works that know a truth in advance and are in the business of disseminating that truth, articulating that truth, dramatizing that truth, arguing for that truth. And there can be extremely, extremely smart works that do that and that are worth, eminently worth reading and thinking about because the authors are being smart in their job, right? In indicting factories, in writing on behalf of peace or against slavery or, uh, you know, that there's a long history to that, and there's very distinguished work. Um, there's very distinguished work in smaller forms that you might call propaganda forms, like protest songs also. And those are sometimes dopey and sometimes smart. And, and of course, it's worth consulting <coughs> with the people who make the smart ones. Um, I think where you are less likely to gain um, illumination from propaganda works in this context is when is, is in a situation where you don't know and no one knows what should happen next, right? Anti-slavery propaganda literature emerges in a situation in which it's pretty clear to a lot of people what should happen next, or at least something about what should happen next, which is slavery should have an end put to it, right? By one means or another, right? And the point is to get as many people opposed to slavery as possible, right? So there's a clear moral framework in which that literature takes place. <clears throat> you are in these, in the infrastructure projects you're dealing with, you're mostly not functioning or imagining functioning in situations in which it's that clear. Right, so the propagandists can only tell you arguments on behalf or reasons on behalf of a position already established. But I wouldn't go to propaganda to Stowe or to Sinclair or to protest songs if I wanted to figure something out. Uh, that I didn't know the answer to, where I had genuine uncertainties, where I was trying to imagine what would make people happy. When slavery was an institution in the United States, it was pretty clear that what would make slaves happier was not being slaves. Then, you know, propaganda tells you a lot. But if you don't know the answer, then I think propaganda will tell you less. And you're totally right. The closer you get to charged political situations, the more common it is for you to be in the presence of works that know the answer on behalf of the revolution or against it, on behalf of 
you know, the, the security state or against it, whatever it is. There, there's an energy to that, and there's something to be learned from it. But works like that know the answer, right? And if you're working in an area where you don't, then at least in my experience, propaganda, even stripped of its negative connotation, won't tell you as m what you want to know, okay? Yeah. comment about waiting for Godot in the prisons, and yeah. I've done a little bit of reading about different projects where they try to do you know, Shakespeare in you know, low-income areas or Shakespeare yeah. in cross-community um, outreach programs. Yeah. And I was curious about whether you envisioned imaginative artists and works by imaginative artists more as a... Um, something that should be worked into an infrastructure project, so opportunities for these types of endeavors, or more as guidelines for thinking about constructing infrastructure? Okay, yeah, that's, that's terrific. Um, so, I mean, the straightforward answer is both, but let me try to, to clarify what I mean. Um, a thing you could say about imaginative literature, so let, sorry, let, let me try to, to, to give a clear context. Let me take the first thing you talked about, that is incorporating imaginative literature into an infrastructure project first, and then I'll talk about imaginative literature as a guide bearing on infrastructure projects. So all cultures that we know of have imaginative arts, right? Whatever else they don't have, and they, you know, like food, um, uh, they have that imaginative capacity of the human mind in them. They allow time for it. They give prestige to it. So it has to matter enormously since we do it everywhere and always. Right? We cannot live as human beings in societies without it, or at least we've never chosen to. Right? We make paintings, we tell stories, we have dances, collective or individual. You know, we sing, we write songs, we compose songs, we tell stories, we remember stories, right? Cultures do that. Right? So an interesting question about the infrastructure projects that you have, and I looked at them uh, in this context, is to what extent they imagine infrastructure for the dissemination of imaginative works. Right? And there are a couple moments when they do. Libraries, for example but relatively few moments in which they do, right? Not performance spaces, for example, or theaters, right? Is a theater as, an Im as important an aspect of infrastructure as a train station? Well, I mean, I don't want, it's hard to weigh them, but, but it's legitimate to ask whether certain mo kinds of infrastructure projects could incorporate the infrastructure that the imaginative arts depend on, even if those are as relatively simple as you know, printing presses and their 21st century equivalents, um, performance spaces, um, loudspeakers, you know, whatever, whatever produces that access and makes the work of imaginative artists distributable, right? And, and makes it possible for imaginative artists to live, you know, and devote their time to their art. So it interested me that the list of infrastructure projects mostly didn't include that. So that, that's your first, the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, I, st I also think that imaginative artists, if you could engage in a dialogue with them, might have ideas about those other projects, like train stations, right, to take an example. Um, Tony Judd, the late um, you know, omni-intellectual, uh, wrote uh, some wonderful pages about train stations in which he talked about the difference between Penn Station in New York the way it used to be and Penn Station in New York the way it is now. I don't know how many of you have been in Penn Station the way it is now, but Penn Station the way it is now is a blight on the human spirit and a depression to the human mind every time you walk through it. Whereas the station across the you know, across the other side of the city on the east side, Grand Central Station, is an illumination and an exaltation of the human spirit and going, people are mostly there to commute, by the way, you know, to, uh, but it makes you happy to be there, right? How did Penn Station, 
that used to be a spirit-exalting place get transformed into a spirit-crushing place, right? Who got consulted on that, right? I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I know that if you consulted any imaginative artists interested in trains and what people feel like and what happiness is, that someone would have said, this is going to make people miserable. Why on earth are you doing it this way? Right? But I presume that nobody got consulted. That is, that the consultation process was within the field of prefabricated expertise and produced this catastrophic and soul-crushing result. So, so in the second category of, of consulting with imaginative artists, as fully living human beings, just to see what the results are, the human psychological holiness enhancing or interrupting results, I think that would also be useful. Hi. Um, so I really like the idea of consulting an imaginative artist, but I was sort of like thinking about like the sort of dichotomy that we see between science and yeah. poetry. And I was thinking of a lot of examples where the two kind of blend together. And I was thinking about TED Talk speakers because their speeches are very informative, very sometimes very technological, but I, I see them as being very poetic. So mm -hmm. would, you, would you think of that kind of person as being an imaginative artist? Well, I think anybody who's capable of wording, putting words together into a, a, you know, a compelling form as an, as an artist, right? What the, use, the specific use of imaginative art has to do with its functioning in the territory of the as if, right? A TED Talk speaker who can be a con consummate artist in the making of words, in the deploying of rhetoric, is mostly trying to describe something that is, right? To explain something the way it, in its nature, right? As opposed to saying, what if X were the case? Or what if, you know, once upon a time there were two children who lived in a wood, you know, with their stepfather at the edge of the forest, right? So I have every admiration for the modes of art used in public oratory. Seems to me a great and scanted art form. Uh, and I would, I, so, so, you know, I'm happy to join in your tribute to, to such artists. I do think there's something different in what poets and writers of fiction and writers of drama do in the sense that they're imagining what isn't. Um, and that's, that's a very powerful uh, tool for us in trying to imagine what, what isn't yet in the world. Um, as regards the first question, by the way, the sort of general sense we have of the, of the split between sciences and arts, um, look, I'd be dopey if I claimed there wasn't any such split. I mean, I grew up reading, you know, C.P. Snow's The Two Cultures, and, and I got taught that when I was a high school student a million years ago. And you know, there's, uh, it's utterly the case that many people who write poetry and plays and fictions can't read scientific literature and vice versa. But I don't think that that should hold or does hold at the highest or in any rigorous sense. Right? There is no reason why the one can't be about the other. Um, there's nothing in the nature of science that makes it you know, at odds with poetry, and there's really nothing about the nature of poetry that makes it at odds with science. So, I mean, I, I would encourage those boundaries to be trampled underfoot. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes. Thank you so much for talking um, today. It was really enjoyable. Um, a lot of what you said in your lecture reminded me of an essay by Audre Lorde called On Poetry. I don't know if many of you have read it. Um, basically, what she states is that poetry is not a luxury. The ideas are birth, born out of language. Yeah. Um, and although you mentioned that imagination and like imaginative writing can transcend and transform people, um, that those who haven't been to jail can imagine what the experiences of that of being in jail is. Mm -hmm. um, but Lord also suggests that. Um, it is mostly white men who've written these great works of poetry that we consider in our society to be great. Um, and therefore, it is their imagination, it is their ideas that are born from the languages that, the words that they have written. Um, and so she goes on to suggest that, you know, she's a radical black feminist woman. And she goes on to suggest that um, 
those who aren't poets need to write poetry. Um, those who are not considered artists should make art. And so um, I think implicitly you yeah. were also suggesting that in addition to consulting experts that we should try ourselves to imagine the world that we want to live in, we should also consult um, people who may not be quote unquote ep experts in artistic or scientific forms of infrastructure. Um, is that true? Uh, you know, that's really beautifully said, and though I can't claim that I knew that that was a, an implication of what I was saying, I'm more than delighted <laughs> to identify this one, because yeah, I think I am, I am, I am suggesting that. That is, the, the split that I'm talking about is not only between different kinds of people, it's between different kinds of capacities in our own minds, and I'm inviting us, especially those of us who are disinclined to turn to those other capacities, to turn to them and see what happens. Yeah, that's, uh, that's great. I'm, I, uh, what they call in uh, parliamentary procedure a friendly amendment. <laughs> okay. Jenny, you've been waiting for a while. Thank you for coming today. Um, I really appreciated the quote that you, um, that you mentioned by Adrian Rich, yeah. about day might be night, love might be hate. And I think that a lot of global issues occur because we tend to see things in binary opposition to each other. Um, and I guess I was just wondering what your thoughts are on in, you know, here we're making the argument that imaginative literature does have a place in global yeah. affairs, but I would say that on the whole in our society right, at, right now, um, a lot of people don't believe uh, that that those two have a place together. Um, and another, uh, Audre Lorde also said that poetry and theory are not actually opposites, that they're, they're one and the same. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on how do you begin to introduce like the day into the night, the art into the, the politics, um, and these imaginative, imaginative ideas into structures where people might not necessarily be at the point of believing that the two are, um, have more commonalities than might be seen on the surface. Um, I mean, in, so you're, in other words, let's say you're convinced that this would be a good thing to do, and then how do you do it? Yeah. Um, well, I... Sorry, I know no, that... No, that's just, I mean, it shouldn't... I apologize for asking a terrific question, even if it's a hard question to answer, right? I mean, <laughs> right? You should pat yourself on the back and, um, and, and just watch the speaker flounder. But um, um, I would say that if you're coming from where I'm coming from, that your first job is to, to understand the perspective and the text of the other person. That is, every year when I've given these talks, I've looked as closely as I could at both how the institute is described and if there are texts being read by people, I've read them and if I can't figure them out then I've asked, asked for help in figuring them out. You know, I've, I've tried to make, to put myself into the position of the, in this case, Justin Lin, right? What's that argument? How does that work? And I haven't read it thinking that I get to dismiss it. All right? And obviously, I didn't think that I could give this talk without reading it, right? So the first job, if you're trying to introduce a novel perspective, a heterodox perspective, a challenging perspective, is to do full honor and justice to the perspective of the people you're talking to. Right. Um, that's what William James says, by the way, in this wonderful essay called The Moral Equivalent of War, where he's trying to make an argument, an anti-war argument, but he wants to inhabit the minds of those who support war as a moral discipline for society. And so he wants to enter fully into that argument, and he quotes it and he reads. He, spent, he must have spent a ton of time reading works that he knew in advance he disagreed with, because he wanted not just to know the arguments of, <coughs> but also to enter the mind of those he was in dispute with. Right? So that would be the first job. And it's my impression that if you do that, my, it's been my experience that if you do that, that there's a moment where you can 
move slightly but significantly from the discourse and the perspective of the people you're talking with to some other heterodox discourse and perspective. But you can't do that if you say, I'm not that interested in what you're doing. Right? Any more than they can suggest to you that poetry or fiction or drama should play some role uh, in thinking about <coughs> uh, social well-being if you're not going to read the poetry and drama and fiction in the first place. So the first step is a humble apprenticeship in the discipline of the people you're trying to change the views of. The, after that, it, you know, I'll try to work out the next step there. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. No, one, two, three. Yeah, you. <coughs> Thank you. Sure. Um, so we were just talking about uh, the idea of binaries in the world, and yeah. you had quoted Stephen Sondheim with his It Takes Two, yeah. and all of these ideas. And I just kind of wonder, obviously this is your field, um, literature and imaginative you know, writing and all that, but what do you think is missing if we include imaginative literature into the politics and cultural and all of that that goes into creating global affairs? I mean, what would be improved by doing that? What else, no, or what other than imaginative yeah. literature? What's another area that you would say is missing as well? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, somebody's ever asked me that before. Um, I'll, okay, so here's, I, it's a very rich question, right? In other words, who should be at the table generally? Rather than my making a specific case for imaginative artists, you're asking, okay, so here's the table, whom do you invite to come sit at it? Um, there are probably a lot of really interesting things to say in response to that. I'll tell you the one that first came into my mind. It has to do with a recommendation made by an imaginative artist, actually, but not for the presence of imaginative artists. The, the imaginative artist in question is Ursula Le Guin, the writer of um, science fiction and fantasy, and, um, and however you want to classify the work, her work. Um, it's an essay uh, called On Crones in the sense of you old crone, you know, a disparaging term for an old and unattached woman. Uh, Le Guin wrote this essay not, not when she was in the crone or geezer category, those are terms she likes, but earlier in her life, and one of her arguments was that every conversation about anything serious needed to include somebody as disregarded and disparaged and disprestiged as a crone an old person, right, given the way in which our culture tends to treat old persons and old women especially and unattached old women especially of all. So an example of a marginal category would be that. Right? Any table, another thing more generally, so I, uh, in the introduction, I was noted that I work, um, for, have worked for a long time with New England war tax resistance. <laughs> Most of what I do has, is, is make grants or help make grants. And a thing that we ask all organizations to tell us about themselves is the makeup of their advisory boards. Um, because, not because we want to say you have to have you know, X percent of this kind of person and Y percent of that kind of person, but because it's extremely important to us that boards be diverse. Right, that a maximum productive diversity have been of age, um, of educational background, of race, of sexual orientation, of any of the markers of identity that give you a new perspective on the world. So I think I'd want a really big table. That's one, you know, as big as the round table, uh, as King Arthur's round table, but populated by people other than white male young guy knights. <laughs> but it's a wonderful question. Yeah. And then you write after that. It's you also just make sure you <clears throat> My name is Alexandra, and I wanted to thank you for your perspective on um, poetry and science. Huh. Especially um, when I was in high school, I took a three-week workshop with Emily Roscoe, who is a Stegner, um, former Stegner fellow at Stanford, um, mm -hmm. poet, and she... Um, I was talking about my aspirations for becoming a physicist, but also appreciating poetry. And she said there's a surprising number of people who yeah. are physicists and sort of, you know, engage in poetry or vice versa. And she said she started out 
as a physicist herself and then became a poet. Um, and now I'm a physics major at Wellesley. And I and find are that... You, and what about the poetry <laughs> side? <What are> you? <laughs> I love poetry still. And um, I you know, still take English classes and really enjoy reading it. And I have a lot of friends, actually, who you know can quote Shakespeare and who are sort of mm -hmm. um, more literary, which is interesting. Um, but I think that there is a niche of people who um, are sort of more imaginative with science and more imaginative in literature. And I sort of think engineering is a little bit like journalism in that there's sort of the goal of both of those, as I see them, is to meet a need and sort of to get either news out to people or to, to fill some sort of um, engineering goal that needs to be met in society, whereas I feel like some aspects of physics and poetry can be linked in that they're more um, explorations of what's possible mm -hmm. and creative ways of thinking about the world and, and yeah. less about meeting an end. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for your perspective oh. on that. that th you're most welcome. I, I, I'll just say two things briefly. One, I mean, I, I don't know that many engineers, so I, I don't, I, I'm, I'm loath to sort of categorize them in advance as, as unimaginative. But I do have one example of a moment where it feels to me like a, a great scientist remark might equally well have been made by a great poet. It's the beginning, it's what, I, what is reported as the beginning of, of Richard Feynman's lecture, Poets for, uh, Physics for Poets lecture, where he says, first question is, what is sand? Right? And then the question is, so how do you get to sand? How small do you have to break things down? How does, does the nature of things change when you break them into these very small pieces? Anyway, so he goes on for you know an hour and a half about what is sand. But the point is that that's a question that could be the first line of a poem or an investigation of a play. And so I, I feel the unity pretty strongly. I'm, I'm glad to hear you echo it. Yeah. <coughs> Hello, my name is Barrett, and I just wanted to say thank you for, for being here and um, offering your perspective, especially I'm a math major, so this is pretty far outside my usual stuff that I study, so this is very interesting. Yeah. Um, it made me think about when we were talking about diversity in um, dealing with infrastructure and global affairs, um, the impact of language on people's ideas yeah. and their concepts. Um, I think most of us have studied a foreign language and realized that there are often concepts in another language that can't be translated yeah. easily. And people in different languages think often very differently. And I'm wondering about like um, the disappearance of many languages now and what impact that might have on imaginative literature and um, society as a whole. All right, so that's a, that's a big question. I don't, I mean, the disappearance of languages seems to me just in, in, to, in totally uncomplicated ways, a, a tragedy. I mean, I mean, languages are extraordinary things, right? Each of them, linguists say, and I, have, and I believe, capable of expressing the whole world and the whole sensibility of the, their speakers. And so the disappearance of one, the death of a language, that's awful. I mean, that's, that's you know, it's, it's a very intense form of a reduction of biodiversity, it seems to me. Um, the question th that you alluded to, the, the different ways in which we think depending on what languages we're thinking in, that's, that's really interesting and complicated. I, I just want to say a little bit about it because I, I, I want to make clear that I, I hold a kind of middle-of-the-road position about that. So in languages that have relatively close relations, the distance between which is relatively small, even such languages have sort of incompatibles between them. I had a French department colleague, uh, now dead, who was writing a book about the relations between American culture and French culture, and a thing that interested her a lot was the American idiom of the waiter who comes to you when you're sort of half finished or three quarters finished with your meal and says, are you still working on that? And Sabine Rafi, my colleague, said there's no way that to translate, that it is utterly unimaginable for a French person to say that because eating is not labor, right? <laughs> right? And finishing your food is, you know, delight rather than a task, right? So, so even at a, at a relatively proximate distance like English and French, but the, uh, there are differences of idiom. <clears throat> the argument gets much more interesting when you're talking about languages at greater distances from one another and the experiments that people have done, the conjectures that they've offered, anthrop that anthropological linguists have offered, mostly concern the differences in perspective from languages that are more remote from one another. From standard average European, which is what Benjamin Worf called, you know, 
English and all the, the most of the languages of Europe, meaning not Basque or Finnish, uh, and you know Hopi or Navajo. That then I, I think there are real differences in perception, perception of motion, um, the perception of the relation between the discrete and the continuous, I mean, pretty fundamental stuff. And there, I think, if you were thinking about infrastructure, um, building something, uh, those differences would matter a lot. Right? It might not matter as much if you're working in Canada and you know, you're an Anglo who wants to build a, you know, a school in a francophone neighborhood. It might, but but less likely. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I also really enjoyed your talk and this emphasis or value of imagination yeah. and toleration for kind of ambiguity or contradictions. And I was thinking also about imagination, not just in um, art or not just imagining the future or the possibility, but also the imagine, imagining of the past. And in my political science class, we studied Susan Buck Morris, who is a political theorist. And she was talking about how uh, our imagination, you know, our uh, historical imagination has been really limited because we think of history in terms of um, winners and losers or, you know, blacks mm -hmm. and whites. And it's um, mm -hmm. kind of in the circle that, you know, yeah. we cannot get out of it uh, to imagine a different past. So she looks at the rupture, the moments of ruptures in history where, you know, these kind of um, identity categories or these um, cliche stories have not been fulfilled mm -hmm. and she believes that this kind of liberates our historical imagination which is also very important for imagining something you know yeah. better for the future so yes I think this is um, yeah. imagination or literature I think is yeah. definitely connected to politics yeah and the political. I think that I, I, I could I could say something about that but but mostly I want to say yeah you're right I, that's it <laughs> no the imagination points back as well as forward I think that's that's really well said yeah. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, sure. The lecture was fascinating. Something that I was particularly interested in that you brought up was the idea that when we read imaginative literature, we can certainly learn from it, but your idea that, for example, only a soldier could truly learn war from Tolstoy. Yeah. And I thought that was fascinating. I took a sort of revolutionary literature class while I was in Egypt during sort wow. of a revolutionary time. Wow. And I thought I was finally starting to understand some things about the world from literature. But then listening to you speak, I just thought it was fascinating that, you know, it would be wrong for me to draw conclusions from the literature without actually having my own experience. And so I was wondering if you could speak a bit more on that and what mistakes we might make and what we can draw from the literature and where we should not yeah. make assumptions. No, that's great. Um, look, here's the thing. I, you know, I, I, I teach in an English department and I've taught in an English department here for 33 years and before that I taught in English departments elsewhere. And I love saying things like, you know, nobody has ever taught us more about the nature of war or the nature of the family than, than Tolstoy, or nobody's ever taught and understood poverty more deeply than Theodore Dreiser and Sister Carrie, or something like that. You know, because those are useful, or at least convenient things to say in a context, but they're, pr they're preposterous for me not to say, but for me to say. Right? I mean, what do I know about poverty? What I know about poverty is what I'm reading in Dreiser's Sister Carrie. Right? I haven't been poor. I don't work with the poor. So it seems to me the height of arrogance for me to make a claim about what Dreiser can teach about that. I haven't been in war, right? My, nobody in my family, <coughs> approximately, you know, in the last you know, five generations, has been in a war. So, and especially as a person opposed to war, where do I get off saying that Tolstoy teaches us about the nature of war? I mean, how can I know that? So part of my claim is, has to do with taming myself, you know, reining myself in and saying, you can't make statements like that. Um, but I also want to claim that exactly what you said, that you, were, you had some experiences with which the, your literary reading could interanimate. Right? There was some thing you could observe in the streets or by talking to people 
that could get illuminated by the works you were reading, and for all I know, vice versa. Um, I, the, the, the way I formulated it in the talk had mostly to do with denying a thing, deny, denying the truth of a thing that I myself have often said and wish I had. Um, and your, what you're reporting, the combination between modes of experience, a kind of internal collaboration, to go back to Ace's point, something that's going on in your head that's both literary and observational. That seems great. Right? Then you're a person whom I would listen to, right? Because you've had this experience, right? I don't mean that I, that you, that I all, all of a sudden believe everything you say, but I would listen to you because you have this um, dialogical sense of what's going on. Does that in any way clarify? Okay. Great. Um, what are, how are we doing about time, by the way? I know. We have time for about one more question. Okay, so somebody's going to ask a really good sum it all up kind of question, <laughs> or any other kind of question that's on your mind at the moment. Yeah, over to you. Um, well, I don't know if it's a good question. And now the pressure's on. Um, but so I keep coming back to this distinction between propaganda and. Yeah what is not propaganda, um, and the idea that propaganda is coercive rather than collaborative. Yeah. Um, and so one question that I think I have been kind of ruminating on as we've been asking questions is how do we classify things like dystopian literature or um, authors' attempts to be intentionally provocative? Um, you know, fatwas come to mind um, with the discussion of Iran. Um, and then good propaganda often masquerades as collaborative or dialectic mm -hmm. so that it can ask you questions and then guide yes. you to the answer it wants you. So how do we, how do we distinguish? Well, I, so in practice, that is, that's a hard question to answer in theory, it seems to me. But it, I don't think it's a very hard question. I think it's a less hard question to answer in practice in the sense that when I read uh, The Jungle or Uncle Tom's Cabin, or uh, Berta von Suttner's book called Ground Arms, uh, used to be the f most famous anti-war novel until it got sort of eclipsed by All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, I know that where the author stands. I, I, I think the author is smart, you know, but, but I know that there's a thesis being advanced right, quite well. And I know when I read War and Peace that that's not happening. Or for that matter, I know that when I read all quiet on the Western Front. That is, that no, there isn't a thesis being advanced. I, f I can feel that. And I think we mostly feel that. Um, dystopian literature, utopian literature, imaginative literature, you know, uh, from The Gift to the Hunger Games to 1984, is always imaginative literature because it's always imagining something that isn't. So we can feel a pro sometimes a propagandistic purpose, but there's often a richness to it because it's set itself the task of imagining a world that transcends the propagandistic point. So. Please join me in thanking you.